Coming up on Arirang News. A summit between South Korean President Yoon Seok-yeol and U.S. President Joe Biden is scheduled for next month. It'll be the third meeting between the two leaders, this time marking the 70th anniversary of the alliance, likely aiming to find ways to deter Pyongyang's nuclear capabilities. South Korea's ruling People Power Party wraps up its leadership race with Kim Gi-hyun elected to head the party. Widely deemed as President Yoon's favorite among the candidates, Kim is tasked with guiding the party through next year's general elections. Every year, International Women's Day celebrates women's achievements and raises awareness of gender inequalities. In light of this, we explore where South Korean women stand in the professional world. Good evening. It's 9 p.m. here in South Korea. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. We begin with a summit being scheduled between South Korean President Yoon Seok-yeol and U.S. President Joe Biden. President Yoon will be visiting Washington in April for a state visit invited by his counterpart. It'll be the third meeting between the two leaders, this time marking the 70th anniversary of the alliance. Security and economy will likely top their summit agenda. Our presidential office correspondent, Oh Soo-young, leads us off. President Yoon seok is set to hold back-to-back -back summits with the leaders of the United States and Japan in the coming weeks, accelerating efforts to jointly address security threats, including North Korea, and economic challenges. Seoul's top office said on Wednesday that Yoon will visit Washington, D.C. next month, marking the first South Korean state visit to the U.S. since 2011. With a state dinner slated for April 26, Presidents Yoon and Joe Biden will hold talks under the theme of Alliance in Action. During his visit to D.C. this week, National Security Advisor Kim jong un said the focus would be on protecting peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula, which he called the basis of the 70-year alliance. Kim said the leaders would seek ways to qualitatively strengthen the Allies' capability to offset North Korea's nuclear weapons, noting that the U.S. has reasserted its commitment to extend the deterrence, with joint military exercises and the deployment of various U.S. strategic assets as a measure to build trust. On the trade front, Kim added that Seoul will also seek measures to minimize damage to South Korean firms hit by Washington's policies that support domestic production of key industrial products, such as semiconductors. Other agendas for the two leaders are cooperation on advanced technologies, economic security and people-to-people -people exchanges, taking the alliance further beyond the realm of military ties. In this regard, the two leaders are expected to discuss furthering their cooperation with Japan, following recent efforts by Seoul and Tokyo to overcome their long-standing disputes. South Korea's plan to compensate Japan's wartime forced labor victims through voluntary donations from the private sector has been challenged domestically, but has drawn a positive response from the U.S. and Japan. According to Japanese media, Tokyo's ruling party chief Natsuo Yamaguchi said on Tuesday that Seoul-Tokyo relations have reached an important turning point, with Prime Minister Fumio Kishida expressing willingness to meet President Yoon even later next week. Observers will closely watch whether Kishida will invite South Korea to the G7 meeting in May. This would set the scene for a trilateral summit of leaders, the third to be held during President Yoon's term. Oh Soo-young, Arirang News. South Korea's ruling People Power Party now has a new leader. Lawmaker Kim Gi-hyun, who was widely deemed President Yoon's favorite candidate, will be tasked with guiding the PPP through next year's general elections. Our National Assembly correspondent Han Song-woo was on site at the party's national convention and files this report. The People Power Party's leadership race has finally come to an end. On Wednesday at the ruling party's national convention in Goyang City, National Assembly member Kim gi was announced the winner, claiming a majority of some 460,000 votes registered party members cast either through their mobile devices or automated phone calls over a four-day period that ended on Tuesday. 
Yes. The 55.1% turnout rate was a record high for the party. The former mayor of Ulsan City, who had widely been considered the frontrunner, won 52.93%, a majority of the ballots, eliminating the scenario of a runoff vote that would have taken place on Friday and Saturday. Let's unite as one and sweep next year's general elections. The authority held by a party chairman is not a right, but rather a duty and responsibility. In the end, runner-up An Chul-su finished the race with 23.37% of the votes, failing to challenge Kim in a one-on-one -on -one debate, which was scheduled to take place on Thursday, had no candidate won a majority. Meanwhile, the other two candidates, Chan Aram, head of a regional chapter of the party in Jeollanando province, and former Prime Minister Hwang kyo won each took 14.98% and 8.72% of the votes. Four new members of the party's Supreme Council and one new young member of the council, a position designated for those under 45, were elected on Wednesday as well. Before the results were revealed, President Yoon seong yeol stopped by to encourage the ruling party and urge its members to come together to build a new nation for the Korean people. 우리 국민의 힘 당내 선거에서는 승자도 패자도 없습니다. 우리 당 구성원 모두 첫째도 국민, 둘째도 국민, 셋째도 국민만을 생각하고 함께 전진해야 합니다. Kim will be expected to guide his party to victory in next year's general elections where it's aiming to secure a majority in parliament and thus help move President Yoon seong yeols agenda forward. The National Assembly is currently controlled by the Democratic Party of Korea, which has been using its majority power to force through bills and motions with the 169 out of 299 seats it holds. Kim, who's being branded a Yoon loyalist, was widely considered to be President Yoon's favorite among the candidates for party chairman. So it's safe to say that Wednesday's result was the ideal outcome for the nation's top office. Han seung Arirang News. In other news, South Korea's state-run think tank says economic concerns linger over declining exports and sluggish domestic demand. It also remains to be seen how much China's reopening plays out. Our Lee Soo-jin has more. Economic turbulence in South Korea remains. That's according to the Korea Development Institute in a report released on Wednesday. The nation's economic slowdown continues as reduced demand for semiconductors has put a dampener on the manufacturing sector. The semiconductor industry contracted due to shipments falling by 44.2 percent and inventories surging 39.5 percent from a year earlier in January. Growth in overall production was down 0.8 percent in January, reversing from a rise of 0.7 percent the previous month. Slow retail sales and service sector production suggest weak consumer spending. Retail sales remain sluggish as sales of durable goods such as home appliances, communication devices and computers fell. Production in the service sector slowed from 6.7 percent to 5.9 percent in January because of declines in accommodation and food services as well as financial and insurance services. The Consumer Sentiment Index stood at 90.2 last month, down from 90.7 in January. The report also stated that housing market declines could hamper recovery in the construction sector. The Institute noted that while the outlook on the global economy is becoming more optimistic following China's reopening, South Korea's exports to China are experiencing a steeper decline. It widened from 29.8 percent in January to slightly more than 31 percent last month. Despite disruptions in the global supply chain easing, major countries such as the U.S. and the U.K. are still experiencing elevated core price inflation. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. 
From AI that could help with labor shortages to smart logistics used in the machinery and equipment industry. You can find them all at the Smart Factory and Automation World 2023 trade show in the South Korean capital. Our Shin ah Young takes us there. The Smart Factory has become crucial as it can give small and medium sized manufacturers a competitive edge. At the Smart Factory and Automation World 2023 trade show in Seoul, LG CNS and IT Solutions unit of LG Group showcase its smart logistics with various functions from storing products to sorting. AutoStore uses robots to manage the storage instead of requiring humans to go to the storage location. When needed, the robot picks the item and delivers it to the person. Also, the task of classifying products is done by sorting robots. It also introduced its robot rental subscription service, which means companies wouldn't need to commit to purchasing one without knowing if they are worth the investment. Another South Korean IT firm, CJ Olive Networks, showcased its smart factory service called Factory One. AI-based technology raises the accuracy of its X-ray machine when detecting foreign substances in food products. Global automation company Siemens introduced its digital twin solution that provides testing and simulations of products by utilizing both real and virtual space. During the event's opening ceremony, South Korea's first vice industry minister emphasized the need to accelerate the use of AI technology. We are pushing ahead with automation and digitization through various policies to address the issue of labor shortages and improving productivity that companies are facing and to prevent safety accidents. Back in January, the industry ministry announced its so-called industrial AI internalization strategy to boost the use of AI technology among companies. Its goal is to increase AI use from 1 percent to 30 percent and nurture over 100 AI suppliers to become globally competitive by 2030. This strategy includes commercializing AI solutions and accelerating the development of AI-related technologies. Meanwhile, the event has a session where the ministry elaborates on the strategy and introduces R&D projects to participating companies. Under the theme of We Connect Your Factory, the three-day event will run through Friday with 500 companies showcasing their latest technologies like smart factory, smart logistics and robotics. Shin ah Young, Arirang News. Over in the U.S., Fed Chair Jerome Powell has hinted at bigger interest rate hikes than anticipated. With the Fed's expected rate hike, some say the Bank of Korea has no choice but to raise its rate as well. The head of the U.S. Central Bank is laying the groundwork for bigger interest rate hikes. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell warned as he made his semi-annual monetary policy report to Congress on Tuesday that interest rates are likely to rise higher than what central bank policymakers had previously expected. In his comments to lawmakers, Powell suggested a more aggressive rate hike to take place later this month, possibly by a larger half percentage point. The latest economic data have come in stronger than expected which suggests that the ultimate level of interest rates is likely to be, to be higher than previously anticipated. If the totality of the data were to indicate <clears throat> that faster tightening is warranted, we'd be prepared to increase the pace of rate hikes. He also signaled further hikes if inflation data continues to run hot, saying that the Fed's focus is bringing inflation back down to 2 percent goal. The Fed's aggressive monetary tightening also has global repercussions. Following Powell's remark flagging the possibility for a higher rate, the dollar recorded an all-time high this year against the basket of six major currencies. The South Korean won also tumbled against the greenback in Wednesday session, with the exchange rate rising by more than 21 at its peak, hitting 1,323.9, nearing the highest level this year. Higher rates in the U.S. could lead to further capital outflows from South Korea as investors look for safety. The U.S. interest rates have surpassed those of South Korea since July last year, and if the Fed raises the rate again this month, the gap could be widened further. 
to prevent this and to curb inflation in the country, an expert says the Bank of Korea is likely to raise its benchmark interest rate in April. The Bank of Korea has no choice but to raise the rates further. The only choice being whether they'll raise it by 25 basis points or 50 basis points. I think, I personally think it'll be 25 because Korea economy is uh, right now substantially weaker than the United States. Every year, International Women's Day celebrates women's achievements around the world. And today, South Korea also held special events across the country to promote support for women. One of them was held by the Korean National Council of Women in the nation's capital under the theme of Equitable Korea Together with Women. South Korea's First Lady Kim Gon-hee joined the celebrations. There she said women's rights have gotten better over time, but women are still exposed to inequality and certain crimes. She also emphasized the need to collectively help women and children affected by the recent earthquake in Turkey. South Korea is consi consistently ranked low among OECD countries in what's called the glass ceiling index, meaning women in Korea often struggle more to climb up the professional ladder. On this International Women's Day, our Shin Sebyeok spoke with experts to explore the root causes of this problem and what could be potential solutions. In 1977, the UN General Assembly declared March 8th as International Women's Day in support of women's rights and global peace. Almost half a century later, women are making significant contributions to both political and business circles worldwide. Progress has been made in South Korea too, but there's still a long way to go. Every year, the British magazine The Economist releases the Glass Ceiling Index that measures the role and influence of women in the workforce. South Korea has consistently ranked dead last among 29 OECD member countries since it was first released in 2013. A sociology professor points out that such a grim reality comes from the lack of good job opportunities given to Korean women. When we say the glass ceiling, it refers to barriers women are facing at the senior level. But here in South Korea, women don't get to that point because they are frequently placed in job positions with limited or no chance for advancement. She also says the old stereotype against women as caretakers at home leads to a vicious cycle that restricts women from pursuing leadership roles. Women are still seen as responsible for housework, putting a lot of expectation on them to do that. On top of that, employers tend to avoid hiring or promoting women, which means they end up stuck in low-level, unstable jobs. While the expert calls for active government intervention, she adds that too many women-friendly, more specifically married women-friendly workplace policies, such as extending maternity leave, could become a constraint in the long term. And such criticism was also echoed by a legal expert. When companies or governments announce gender equality policies, unmarried women or male employees tend to only focus on the benefits that they are not eligible for, and this could cause backlash for married women. The lawyer also suggests that when it comes to legal efforts for gender equality at workplaces, incentivizing change may be more effective than imposing penalties. As a fundamental solution to breaking the glass ceiling, both experts say continuous education aimed at raising awareness for women's empowerment can bring about real change. Shin Sebyeok, Arirang News. In the sports arena, the 2023 World Baseball Classic is returning after a six-year break with four groups of five teams competing in four different locations. That being said, Team Korea is in Tokyo for its first match against Australia this coming Thursday. Our Choi Soo-young has more. Team Korea is all set for the World Baseball Classic. They had two practice games against Japanese pro baseball teams Oryx Buffaloes and Hanshin Tigers on Monday and Tuesday. Despite losing 2-4 against Oryx, they bet Hanshin 7-4, giving Team Korea a confidence boost ahead of their opening WBC game. The 2023 World Baseball Classic features 20 teams divided into four pools of five. Team Korea is in Pool B, which is based in Tokyo. 
Devil Face, Australia, Japan, Czech Republic and China. The Korea Baseball Organization and head coach Lee Gang Chol announced their roster on January 4th. Team Korea includes 15 pitchers, two catchers, eight infielders and five outfielders. According to KBO officials, it boasts Korea's strongest WBC lineup ever, with several former and current major leaguers. The two major leaguers, St. Louis Cardinals infielder Tommy Hyunsu Edmund and San Diego Padres infielder Kim Ha Sung, are expected to bring synergy to the team. U.S. magazine Baseball America last Tuesday named three Korean players among its top ten prospects for the tournament. Last season's KBO MVP Lee Dong hoo was fourth on the list, along with first baseman Kang Baek ho and second baseman Kim Hae-sung. Team Korea had its first match against Australia at Tokyo Dome on Thursday at midday Korea time. And on Friday, Team Korea takes on local rival Japan at 7 p.m. Head coach Lee says his aim for now is to reach the semi-finals, which will be played in Miami. Many people say Team Korea is in a crisis, but I will use this as an opportunity to play as many games as possible with the team roster filled with young players and veterans. Only the top two teams in each pool advance to the quarterfinals. Team Korea will be hoping to do better than 2013 and 2017 WBC tournaments when they fail to reach the quarterfinals. Choi Soo Hyung, Arirang News. South Korea is ramping up efforts to host the World Expo in 2030 in its second largest city, Busan. On Wednesday, the Expo's bid committee signed a memorandum of understanding with Busan city government and South Korean conglomerate Lotte Corporation. They'll join hands to prepare for an on-site visit by the Expo's organizer, the Bureau International de Expositions, in April, as well as to raise public awareness of Korea's efforts to win the bid. The bid committee added that it'll work closely with both the public and private sectors until the host city is named in November. South Korea is competing against Italy, Saudi Arabia and Ukraine. The world's second biggest Ferris wheel is going to be built in South Korea. The Seoul city government on Wednesday announced that the Seoul Ring, as it's been named, will be complete, completed by the end of 2027 with the aim of making it a global attraction. The Seoul Ring will be 180 meters in height, but it won't have spokes like a regular Ferris wheel and will be operated with renewable energy. It will be built in Hanar Park in Seoul's Mapo district. City officials said the park was chosen as a gateway to Seoul and is closely located to North Korea, representing people's desire for harmony and unification. The biggest Ferris wheel in the world is in Ain Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. As firefighters continue their battle against the wildfire in Hapcheon, Gyeongsangnam-do province, the Korea Forestry Service has issued a level 3 wildfire warning, the second highest level in its four-notch system. The warning came at 5.30 p.m. on Wednesday after the fire reportedly started just before 2 p.m. The KFS says, 33 helicopters and nearly 550 firefighters have been deployed, but the operation is expected to continue overnight amid strong winds of 14 meters per second. The zone affected by this fire is reportedly around 123 hectares. As of now, 210 people have been evacuated from their homes. President Yoon suk ordered relevant authorities to work at full capacity to make sure the fire is put out as soon as possible. Mild spells will carry on for tomorrow with unseasonably warm temperatures for the daytime. Conditions will be close to what we normally see in late April. Highs in Seoul will be warm about 6 degrees on average at 17 degrees Celsius. Southern parts of the country such as Gwangju and Pohang will see daytime highs surpassing 20 degrees. 
And starting tonight, a group of rain clouds will be dropping showers across central regions. As for the amount of rainfall, northern Gyeonggi-do and Gangwon-do provinces will see 5 to 10 millimeters. The surrounding regions, including the Seoul metropolitan area and Chungcheong-do province, will see less than 5 millimeters. Because the amount of rainfall will be fairly trivial, dry conditions will persist across inland regions. And morning temperatures will be warm overall. Seoul and Gyeongju will be starting off at 8 degrees tomorrow. Showers will taper off by the daytime. Highs in Seoul will jump to 15 degrees. Daejeon 19, Daegu and Gyeongju will be very warm at 23 degrees. And brief showers are in the forecast for the entire nation on Sunday. That's all for now and here are the weather conditions around the world. That brings us to the end of the newscast. Thanks for watching. We'll be back with the latest news tomorrow. Good night.